Hello, Kaiser. It's a pleasure to have you here at our, world, our, at our media center at the World Hydrogen Congress in Rotterdam. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So I'm really looking forward to our talk. I mean, you're from Age to Green Steel and um, you have quite some um, large ambitions when it comes to supplying green steel to Europe. But we, before we start to dig in a bit deeper on your ambitions, I would like to know what was your journey to um, hydrogen and to especially Age to Green Steel? Um, yeah, no, so actually my journey started about 10 years ago now. Um, I was uh, leading a division at Sandvik for fuel cells. So they are making components for, for the bipolar plates. And uh, that's why my first kind of uh, exposure to the world of hydrogen. And I was amazed. That was really the first step. Back then, it was, we were a very few, a small group of believers, and there was a lot of haters, you could say. It was a lot about the fight between electric vehicle, or like um, battery-driven electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles. Um, but that's where it started for me. Then a couple of years later, I was responsible of research and innovation at Yara International. Um, it's a fertilizer company. And we were looking, so in the innovation field, we were looking a lot into how we could move to electrolysis rather than using uh, natural gas reforming as a feedstock for hydrogen. And then we also could see that maybe ammonia could be a fuel for, for sh the shipping industry. It's not only for fertilizer or uh, detergents or explosives, it's actually also a new applications for it. And then you could see it's actually about the energy system as well. So that's where my, my eyes went open a bit on what an amazing opportunity this is. And it's not really about the transport sector now, it's about the industry. So a few years later then, when I got the question if I wanted to join h to Green Steel, where I could really apply my passion and knowledge about hydrogen um, as a gas, but also what you can do with it, into such a large scale initiative that could change the world, for many people, I just said yes. Yeah, I mean, it definitely can. I mean, you have some really ambitious targets. You want to supply five megatons of um, green steel um, to Europe by 2030. Um, so could you perhaps explain a bit how you want to do it? What are the plans and next steps and the project steps to reach this target uh, till 2030? So first of all, I should say that our purpose as a company is to decarbonize hard to bake industries and we start with steel. That's not where we stop. So at the core, we are a green impact company or a company centered around large scale green hydrogen production. And steel is coming first. And there are different reasons for why we believe steel is first. So that's just the starting point. What we are doing as our first project is to build a fully integrated green steel mill in the north of Sweden, close to the Arctic Circle. Um, it's, Sweden is divided in four electricity zones and the one in the north is where you have the best electricity prices and you have an abundance of green uh, electricity generation. So that's the main reason I would say for why we locate the plant up there. When you are building a green steel mill you have obviously a steel mill that has the capacity then to produce five million tons of steel. Step before is the iron production, so the DRI, or direct reduced iron production. That is fed then by um, 760 megawatt electrolysis. That can only be possible to make green if you are then feeding your electrolysis with renewable power. Uh, and, and the majority of that is coming from hyd uh, hydropower and some wind on PPA agreements with base load power. So we have very little storage. Um, and just everything is, is connected in one site. The total site is about 300 hectares. It, it's massive. Massive. <laughs> it is really it massive. Is. Um, yeah, you get very humble when you get up there. It's, um, it's, I can it's, imagine. it's a huge, huge area. Uh, and we got our permissibility permit in July. Uh, it was a Swedish record, so we submitted our application to the court uh, end of December, and so it took about six months to get the permit. Um, and th that helped us so we can start constructing or ground preparation. Because in the north of Sweden, as you probably understand, it's very cold in the winter, so it's, we have to start now. 
Um, in, at the same time, we are working on our operational permit, uh, so we can build the plant, but we can't operate it right now. So uh, we are doing that. Uh, we have, in order for our financing, because this is a new venture, um, we have our founders that also founded Northvolt, a battery company. Uh, we have now, we are in our B round of financing. Uh, so the equity side is we are gradually filling up uh, on that and we have announced some months ago about 190 million euro equity uh, coming in from four uh, lead investors and eight followers. Um, it's a mix of uh, pension funds and more uh, the Scheffler family from Germany um, is coming in. And um, so, so that's uh, coming along, um, aiming for financial close then next year, with also the bank financing. And total, we need about five billion euro uh, for this venture, where one third will be equity, two thirds bank financing. In order to do that, uh, we need to sign offtake agreements uh, with customers uh, of steel. So uh, that is, you could say, collateral almost for the banks. Uh, so far we have sold out uh, 1.5 million ton uh, and you mentioned 5 million ton for 2030 but we, our plan is to come live in 2025 but the first phase is 2.5 million ton. So we have pre-sold 1.5 out of that. Um, and that is uh, at take or pay agreements and also at a premium above a brown steel uh, market index. So it's, it's following the brown steel at a premium of around 150, uh, 125, 150 euro, you could say. Um, we do believe that the green premium will go up. Um, but right now, this is what we need to have a bankable case. So that's what I say where we are. But there are so many different things. It's very, very complex to do. Uh, and of course, a, a super important part of this is to find the best people in the world. And we are recruiting from all over the world. Uh, we are 150 people right now, ish, somewhere there, um, and uh, probably 30 nationalities. So DRI, you have to recruit from Middle East. Yeah. Uh, Minimal, you for steel, you need to recruit a lot from the US. Uh, electrolysis, anywhere in the world where we can find them, because there are not that many. It's <laughs> actually know. built. Of course, I think we could talk about um, these kind of mega projects um, for the whole day because there's so many different interesting aspects um, from supply chain to um, recruiting to the site, just the sheer size. Like, uh, but taking it back a bit more to really to the basics is the question, how do you define green steel? So, because I think there's a lot of um, definitions already existing around the world, um, but none really takes it from a greenfield approach like you are doing. Mm -hmm. No, and that is a very good question. And, and green steel to us is it's at the core, like the definition of that is at the core of what we do. Uh, we are very much following what the customer wants. Uh, and the customer, at least the customers we talk to, they are committed to science-based targets. And if you are that, you, are, you care about scope one, two, and three emissions. So that is the important part, how much you actually emit in the value chain. And that brings you to calculating kilos of CO2. So that is the most important part that defines how green you are. And we do believe that we will be the greenest one in the industry. There, there might be a few other ones um, with similar production co um, conditions in the north of Sweden, north of Norway, or I would say also in the Iberian Peninsula, if you take Europe, that could be as green. But otherwise, it will be shades of green. Uh, and, and we do believe that is needed, but it's also needed to, to have transparency and traceability of how green you actually are. And that should be connected how much premium that you could take for your product. And hopefully that can then drive the industry to be greener and greener and greener. And that is what the climate needs, right? Absolutely. It's, it's, it is really connected. So what we believe in is to have this uh, commercial incentives for, for transforming your business.
Um, we are then looking at scope one, two, three for us in terms of so the product that we would deliver to uh, the auto industry, for instance, they will have a total value of how many kilo CO2 we have emitted or this product has emitted until it comes to, to their door. So that's our definition. We are not we are aware of mass balancing and, and other creative ways to get a green product and it might be a good starting point. But we do believe when truly green products are entering the market in 2025-ish, that is not going to be possible anymore, at least not for the premiums that are paid today. Yeah. That's what we see. Yeah. And then, I mean, you already mentioned that you almost like you sold more than half of um, your expected production in 2035 already to customers. So was this already um, part of the offtake agreements and the customer discussions like um, the maximum amount of CO2 load on a batch of steel or a ton of steel? Uh, you mean uh, um, the max or the CO2 the load? The CO2, yeah. Yeah, so that is, the, but, but the interesting thing here is that very few actually know, very few have, have done this kind of calculation down to the mine. Uh, so it is, I would say, a very constructive dialogue with the customer. Uh, obviously, they want to go as low as possible, and we also. So it's, but it's been a journey to kind of find that point. And it still depends, I would say, on where you get your iron ore from. So different mines have different um, emissions. Uh, but hopefully that can also lead or push mines to turn into green operations as well. Okay, mm -hmm. and then perhaps uh, my last point, because you mentioned the uh, different mass balancing approaches, different approaches in calculating a carbon load of um, the steel. Um, when we look at um, the regulations, because now we have a Renewable Energy Directive 2 with a delegated act on RFNBOs, so the quotas for the transport sector for renewable fuels. Do you think something like a clear regulation will be needed from 2025 on or 2030 on for steel as well, so that we have a clear European view on what is green, how you calculate it, what's the underlying, for example, life cycle assessment and even sustainability assessment for a batch of green steel? Mm. I mean, we, we do see the demand there anyway. And we do see a uh, supply demand uh, on, like, gap. So we do think that it's going to be, be more demand than how fast you can build out uh, truly green products. And then you have the mass balancing part, and that's a different thing. But so, so that is one side of it. It might help. Uh, I think for like consumer-based industries like the automotive, hopefully it's not needed. Hopefully we, like when we are buying a car, we start to ask for that and is willing to pay more for a car that is based on green steel and that will solve it uh, anyway in one way. But if you take industries like utilities or if you like um, construction, uh, windmill, like offshore windmill product where you have a lot of CO2, 